Okay, good morning everyone, and sorry for the delayed start, but there is a manifestation outside, so it's a bit difficult to get in for some people, so probably during the session more and more people will, uh, will come in the room. My name is Bas Eickhout, I'm member of this parliament, for the Greens of course, and for today we have a very important topic on the agenda, which is the well, another roadmap, you could say. Uh, this commission uh, loves roadmaps. That's because then they don't have to do as much legislation. Uh, and therefore, they do a lot of roadmap. But nevertheless, you can be cynical about the roadmaps. But of course, it is important to look into the longer future and where do we stand in 2050 and what needs to be done to get there. And that is, of course, very important because some actions for 2050 need to be taken now in order to be ready in 2050. In this uh, spring, the Commission uh, published its roadmap, which you all are aware of, of the low carbon economy roadmap until 2050. And we all know why the term ro uh, low carbon has been chosen, because with low carbon you can go in all directions, but in the end it needs to be low CO2 emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, and how are you going to achieve that? Crucial, of course, is the energy sector to achieve your low carbon targets, the greenhouse gas reductions between 80 to 95 percent for Europe in 2050. And probably in a month the Commission will publish its energy roadmap with a lot of scenarios expected on to show how you can reach those targets of 80 to 95 percent reduction of greenhouse gases in 2050. But then of course with different choices on your energy system. Well for us it really makes a lot of difference whether you go for a coal economy with a lot of CCS and nuclear or whether you go for a green scenario with renewables. And I think that is of course the important topic to be discussed today is to make sure that the scenarios we're talking about when we're discussing energy are not only low carbon but are also particularly green and renewable because that is the only real long-term solution. So we're going to discuss that today. We have a, well, we have a row of great speakers to, uh, to give us a flavor on, first, Felix Mattes gives us a flavor on what's at the European side ready for scenarios, different scenarios for 2050, but then focusing on Europe. And afterwards, Felix will change his hat, well, not his hat, it's from his same institute, the Oko Institute, but then he will do a more brief introduction on a specific scenario for Germany. Then we've got Nick Moho sitting next to, the, to Felix on your right there. And he's head of energy policy at WWF, and he will say a bit more on the UK scenarios. Next is going to be Andre Kastenberg from the Institute of, for Sustainable Development, and he will say more on the discussion on the green scenarios in Poland, and far on the right for the audience, but the left for my side, which sounds probably better, is Juan López de Oralde, of course, former head of the Greenpeace Spain, and now leader of the new Spanish Green Party, and you will more draft and ideas on what's going on in Spain. But first, I give the floor to Felix Mertes from the Oco Institute to give a more comparison of the existing scenarios for Europe 2050. Felix, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Bas. Thank you for the kind introduction, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, maybe it's because of my job, uh, but I love scenarios. Uh, although, or, and, and without any doubt, scenarios are no substitutes for policy, it is very important uh, to make these exercises to get clear on what is ahead and what are schedules and timetables for policy. And therefore, I believe that the scenario exercises, and I will describe you some of these, uh, are, uh, are an important uh, fundament for uh, an accountable and robust policy for the future. 2030 and 2050 is about the future. I think we should recall first uh, why we are doing this. And I think uh, in these times it's often ignored that uh, we are ahead of significant challenges we have to deal with. And so within these scenario debates, and therefore I recall these, uh, this background, we have in the end of the day two debates. The first is, does it make sense 
to go for these long-term ambitious <laughs> strategies and policies? And secondly, if yes, how? And I think we should, we should uh, bear in mind that during the next weeks when the Commission will probably publish the energy roadmap in the end of November, that we will have both debates uh, on what and if and on how. And we should, we should recall that we have the climate challenge uh, that means 80 to 95 percent emission reduction by the mid of the century and that we have also an issue of energy security which is not only an issue of security and disruptions of supply, it is also an issue of the future vulnerability of consumers and economy towards high and volatile prices at the global energy markets. And uh, as all owners and renters of houses will see in the next year when they get their bills on space seating uh, for this year, then Europe will experience for the first time what it does mean if oil prices are high and the euro is weak. Because in 2008, when we had this, uh, this situation for the first time, Europe was saved by the strong euro. Uh, and we have to be very clear on this. Why are these long-term scenarios important? Uh, 2050 is a long time ago. It's, it's a long time ahead of us. Uh, and I personally will probably not experience this year, but many of, the, of you in the, in the room here will see the year 2050. In other words, especially with regard to the energy sector, 2050 is, one, is between one and three uh, investment cycles away from today. Decisions on power plants and infrastructure during the next 10 years will be decisive for emission levels uh, in the power sector uh, and the innovation cycle in the transport sector and the renovation of, of buildings uh, will go through two to three cycles and then we will be arrived at 2050 and therefore it is important to do this. The second is uh, if we bear in mind this this short period in terms of investment cycles, then we have to ensure consistency of the long-term targets and the long-term strategies and the short and medium-term policies. And policies are always short and medium-term, but they have to be consistent with the long-term uh, challenges and with the long-term goals. And we have increasingly complex interdependencies. Uh, in a world where decarbonization is an issue also for the transport sector, we can't treat this power sector and the transport uh, sector separately any longer because we will see strong sector integration. And so the investment cycle, even for the, uh, for the transport sector, is, because it's, because it's linked to the power sector, it's, it's one investment cycle. Uh, we have... Uh, some crucial issues on the availability of sustainable biomass. We have uh, difficult discussions on CO2 storage potentials and we have, a, we, we have a major challenge in terms of public acceptance because we have to present a consistency, a long-term consistency to the public if we would like to raise acceptance. These are the years of scenarios. Uh, we have seen in this year a series of scenarios, we will see additional ones, and we have seen in the previous years comparable exercises. We have the low carbon economy roadmap for 2050, which was published in March this year, which has analyzed a large range of scenarios and has presented a lot of results. The problem is it is not, I think, or let's say transparency on assumptions and results could be improved. Uh, at least to, uh, to, to enable an enlightened and an in-depth uh, discussion which is necessary. We will see in the end of this year the Energy Roadmap 2050. We will there see different scenario profiles with different strategies, with different motivations. They are not yet available and hopefully the transparency will be 
uh, will be ensured in a way that we really can have an, an, an enlightened debate. That means that I can base my scenario comparison for these 15 minutes uh, only on previous, previous scenario exercises. Uh, at least we have for the European Union four major scenarios which, where we can learn significant lessons from. That's the Greenpeace Energy Revolution, that's the Roadmap 2050 project from the European Climate Foundation, which is uh, mainly focusing on the power sector. We have the Euroelectric Power Choices exercise, which is dealing with energy, the energy sector, but has a strong focus on the power sector. And we have the Vision Scenario project of us, which, uh, which covers all greenhouse gas emitting sectors, that means including agriculture, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I think, uh, and I only want to illustrate uh, the importance of the different sector at the example of the vision scenario project. Here you can see the difference between the reference scenario, which, which is based on current policies, and the so-called vision scenario, which is targeting uh, the 90% the, the emission reduction. The only purpose I show you this is to, 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 to illustrate that there are at least three key sectors which will be decisive on the long-term issue. The number one sector is the power sector. Uh, uh, the, the, the decarbonization of the power sector and the transformation of the power sector will be decisive also for the transport sector and other sectors. The second is the transport sector, and the third is the more complicated uh, sector uh, because it's getting very uncomfortable, and I will get uh, back to this even for greens uh, if you have to deal uh, with CO2 emission reduction in the steel sector and if you are, uh, do not uh, like CCS. But that is, that's another situation. Uh, the key issue is, and I think that's the important, and that's the, that's, the, that's the point, the trajectory is about reducing one gigaton of carbon dioxide equivalent uh, in every decade for the upcoming four decades. Uh, and that is uh, another slide from the vision project, and, and, and I only want to illustrate the challenges before I, be, before I come to the comparison. Uh, it is about primary energy, and there are at least two key issues. What is the level of future demand? And you can see here there is a difference between the reference scenario and the vision scenario, which is partly relying on different statistical treatment of renewable energies, but it is about what is the level of energy consumption of the future. And the second is what is the energy mix? And if we are going for this long-term decarbonization, then there is one point absolutely clear. Uh, in 2050, we, will have, we, we can't have uh, major shares of fossil fuels in the energy mix. The second is um, a key pillar is the transformation of the power sector. And uh, this is the illustration again of the vision scenario. If we would like to go for a transformation towards renewables, that will uh, change the structure of the power industry significantly. We have at the moment a world in the European Union where the power or industry and the structure of the, of the power plant fleet is organized in horizontal layers. There's the base load, there's the medium load, power plants and there's a, there are the peak load power plants. The, the major change which will arise from the transformation if we go for renewables that will uh, mean for the European Union a major shift towards wind and solar and that is changing the structure of the energy system into vertical layers. Months with high wind, months with low wind, months with high wind, uh, daytimes with high solar, daytimes with low solar. And so the total system, uh, the total structure of the, shis of the system will change from a horizontal orientation to a vertical orientation. Okay, we, if we have a look on the scenarios, then there is an interesting point. 
although these scenarios are very different, uh, they agree on a series of points. And we are uh, just working on a more broad comparison of all these scenarios, and I would also like to describe only uh, I like to describe you some of the key of the of the key uh, agreements and disagreements the first is whatever you think about all the details all the scenario analysis shows that it is uh, feasible uh, and that's important uh, that the potentials for ambitious medium and long term transformations are available and that's a change in mindset. When I started my career at, at Öko Institute in, the, in, in 1990, we had famous articles in famous journals from famous professors who, who, who tried to explain us what is the technical potential of wind energy in Europe. And today, we are in Germany at the five-fold of the potential which was thought to be, which was thought to be the technical potential for Europe in the early 90s, and that's a major. So it is feasible. Second, uh, all the scenarios agree that the decarbonization of some sectors with different strategies is key. It's about the power sector, it's about the transport sector, and it's about the building sector, because of the long lead times and the long living capital stocks and the strong role of innovation and last but not least the sector integration of these sectors. Third, all the scenarios agree that the timing of the investments and the innovation for key sectors is crucial. That means that we have no flexibility to make some key decisions definitely not all decisions, but some key decisions within the next 10 years. There's no, there's no, uh, there's no dispute and there's no disagreement on this. And the last point is that uh, although the calculation of costs for a time four decades ahead is very, very difficult, uh, the analysis, the numerical analysis shows uh, some convergence on the cost, although the cost assumptions differ widely. Uh, what we can see, uh, and that is the common ground of all the scenario, that the decarbonization of the power sector can be achieved at costs which are significantly less, but, uh, less than 20% uh, uh, above the business as usual. Uh, there are some scenarios where the costs are, are significantly lower because the additional cost depends on your cost assumptions for the price of fossil energy in 2050. And we don't know what the price of fossil energy is uh, in 2050. And the, and, and, the, and the paradox thing is the more expensive scenarios are the more robust scenarios because the uncertainties of technology costs, which, which have to be brought to the market, are much lower than the uncertainties of many of the fossil fuels. However, this is uh, the spotlight on the power sector. If we add up all the costs for the different sectors, then there is a strong agreement that the total cost for the European Union economy is, one, is between one and two percent of GDP or less. In other words, that the level of GDP which was projected to be reached at 2050 will be reached in 2051. That's the order of magnitude we are talking about. And that's, the, that's a totally different order of magnitude we are talking in the recent debates. There is another set of agreements, the key bottleneck is neither technology and probably nor the costs, although these are important issues, but timely infrastructure decisions. And there are at least three major points, and, uh, and, and, and the, the scenarios have elaborated on this uh, at a different level of detail. But the, uh, the first challenge is our investment decisions in the next 10 years on the infrastructure under uncertainty. 
And we have a situation where the regulatory scheme we are running the infrastructure uh, uh, in does not, is not able to scope with uncertainties. And the, uh, the infrastructure rollout and infrastructure extensions under uncertainty are, uh, is the key regulatory challenge. The second is, uh, the, uh, the, the, sh the second challenge is, and that's more for the textbook style economists, uh, is that the, that the existence of infrastructure or even the non-existence of infrastructure has implications for an appropriate policy mix. If infrastructure plays a role, then you can't stick, at least in some parts of the policy mix, not be on the myth of technology neutrality because you can't wait that the market will provide offshore wind uh, without making early, early infrastructure decisions because the market can't decide on the competitiveness on offshore wind if there is no infrastructure. And I think that is an important issue. And the third is, and that is the bad news, that the transformation is infrastructure intensive. And so we have to work hard on public acceptance. But for public acceptance, you have to present a longer-term vision which presents a motivation for all these infrastructure decisions. And so without this long-term stuff, it, is, it will not work. And there's an, a, a last agreement, and I will come to the disagreements afterward, that we have some electrification, that the electrification of some key sectors, especially the transport, will create a new demand of energy. The key issue is what will be the net effect, and there we come uh, to, the, uh, to, uh, to the differences. The level, the level of energy efficiency is very, very different in the different scenarios. And obviously, in a scenario which was commissioned by the energy suppliers, uh, the level of energy efficiency is comparatively low. Uh, uh, in other scenarios, it's much higher. So the key issue is, and we should be very careful on this, the key issue on energy efficiency is to distinct carefully between the new applications and the new appliances like transport and the traditional appliances and the, and the traditional sectors. Electric appliances and the heat market are key. And that leads to significant differences. If you have a look uh, to the power choices scenario from Euroelectric, they assume that the power consumption within Europe will increase about, uh, about a bit less than 60% by the year 2050. And a world where you have to supply the, uh, the electricity system uh, to, to meet a demand which is 60% higher than, than, than at the moment is a different world than uh, the, the world in the vision scenario where we have a net effect of 13%. Uh, McKinsey has calculated in the ECF roadmap a uh, 42% roadmap. And that highlights, again, that highlights again that energy efficiency cannot be ignored. That energy efficiency is a key issue. The second is the portfolio of the carbon-free energy sources is, uh, is a key. We have, to, we have developed this these, uh, these scenario which is based fully on renewables. Uh, we have the 40, 60, 80 percent renewable scenario in the ECF roadmap, and the remaining share comes equally distributed among nuclear and CCS. And uh, if, you have, if you base your analysis on the, on the, on the Euroelectric power choices, then uh, the first number is not that much uh, 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 irritating. It's 26% nuclear. It's less of, of today. But in absolute terms, that means an increase of the nuclear power generation in the EU 27 by nearly 50%. And you could ask yourself if this is realistic and if it's acceptable. Uh, they have a higher share of 35% uh, 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 renewable share, which is a 200% increase and 30% of CCS. And that's the, that's the order of magnitude we are talking about. Uh, and so the question is not only what, is, what are the shares, what's, but also what is the reality of the rollout of the extensive, of the absolute uh, levels. Last slide is uh, what we should not ignore in the discussion on the scenarios is that it is about cumulative CO2 emissions. The climate problem, the climate problem is created by concentrations of greenhouse gases and it's about cumulative emissions. 
And if it is about cumulative emissions, then early action is a decisive issue for the total uh, cumulative emissions by the year 2050. And we should not ignore that different trajectories are leading to different, uh, to different uh, cumulative emissions. If you postpone action, then that will increase cumulative emissions even if you meet the target of decarbonization in 2050. So that's the commercial. Uh, uh, if you would like to read uh, uh, the vision scenario in more detail, then you can uh, see the download link here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Felix. I think that it gives a very good overview on, on what we're talking about at the European level, at the level of renewables from 35% to almost 100%, and also, of course, the increase of electricity and the role of energy efficiency, and of course, also the bottleneck of infrastructure. Uh, I think I will now have, give the word to Nick, because I can give you some rest now, otherwise you have to do it in Germany now immediately. So we first move to the UK, because I thought of the UK when you were discussing the myth of technology neutrality. And I know in the UK they love this debate on technology neutrality. And I think Nick will give some insights on how the debate is going on and what kind of scenarios are there for the UK. So Nick, the floor is yours. Thank you. Right, hello everyone. Um, and thank you for coming. So I'm going to uh, give you a quick overview of a very new report that is actually being launched next month uh, in the UK. Um, called Positive Energy, uh, which is a report that looks at the potential uh, for renewable energy deployment in the UK out to uh, 2030. And before going into uh, the depth of the report and the give you a, a taster for the scenarios, I'm just going to give you a little bit of context of where we're at in the UK at the moment. So we're currently uh, in a context where everyone talks about 2030. So we do have a Climate Change Act in the UK that requires um, us to reduce our emissions by at least 80% by 2050 compared to 1990 levels. But the, the focus on 2030, primarily because the Committee on Climate Change, the independent climate watchdog, um, advised the government in its latest carbon budget report that the power sector in the UK needed to be near de decarbonized by 2030. What this means in practice is that the UK power sector today has a carbon intensity of around 500 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. And what the Committee on Climate Change is saying, we need to reduce that tenfold by 2030 down to 50 grams. So quite a substantial decrease. And clearly, as Felix was just saying, the reason for that is that not, uh, not only does the power sector represent 37% of our emissions in the UK, but it's about, uh, we're about to embark on the, on the process of electrifying heating, of electrifying transport, and therefore that will increase the amount of sectors of the economy covered by the power sector, therefore uh, a reduction of, um, uh, of carbon intensity level is absolutely key. So how does the government in the UK want to actually get there? Well, we're currently going through a very long consultation process called the Electricity Market Reform, or EMR. The EMR, uh, is basically the biggest attempt to reform the UK electricity market since uh, privatization under the Thatcher government. And the idea is to deliver an affordable, secure, and decarbonized electricity sector by the early 2030s. And the thing I should stress here is that, uh, unfortunately, the, the white paper that was released by government in the summer is very vague, so it, it does keep talking about low carbon generation and how that low carbon generation can be incentivized by government. And it talks about decarbonization by the 2030s, but it doesn't specify a specific date or a specific target. So the government hasn't yet fully endorsed the advice from the Committee on Climate Change. Um, and so clearly, the government is looking at not just incentivizing renewables, but nuclear as well. Now, um, in terms of renewables specifically, uh, despite enormous resources, and I'll, I'll show you a quick overview of the UK renewable resources offshore in a minute, but despite very big resources, the UK is actually really lagging behind the rest of Europe when it comes to renewable energy deployment. Um, we, at the end of 2010, we, only, uh, we were only generating about seven to seven and a half percent of our electricity from renewable sources. And according to the Pew report, We've only had, at the end of 2010, we only had seven and a half gigawatt of renewable energy projects that were actually operational. Now this is obviously way, way behind what Germany has, or even Italy, but surprisingly, despite all the um, uh, France's reputation for very much uh, being focused on nuclear, the UK ha actually has a smaller installed renewable energy capacity than France, which is uh, rather surprising. 
This just gives you a very quick overview uh, from a report called the Offshore Valuation Report. Now, this was a report issued last summer by government, industry, and the Crown Estate. And the Crown Estate is a very British organization, which is very hard to explain it outside of uh, the UK. But they essentially own the seabed on behalf of uh, the Queen and the, and the UK taxpayers. And they, therefore, did a big study to look at, well, what is the potential of renewable energy offshore for the UK? And the findings were pretty staggering. Uh, they found that uh, by looking at the UK seas and only looking at the, at the areas of the UK seas where you could conceivably install renewable energy infrastructure, the UK could actually generate 2,131 tower hours of electricity from its offshore resources. Uh, to put this in context, this is six times the level of electricity demand in the UK before the recession. So uh, pretty, and that obviously comes on top of pretty big onshore renewable energy resources, uh, especially uh, onshore and wind related ones. So what we set out to do uh, at WWF UK was to challenge a perception which uh, uh, was fairly rife in the UK uh, media and, and uh, public talk about renewables uh, last year, which was very much this idea that if you have a high renewable energy system, the lights will, will go out and we'll, we'll be in the dark the minute there's no wind. And, um, and that very much actually underlined why government was so focused on incentivizing nuclear as well as, as, as renewables. So the question we asked um, uh, our consultants was, can the UK power system be decarbonized by 2030, by which I mean reduce its carbon intensity to 50 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour, which is what the Committee on Climate Change says we need to do, and be kept completely secure by relying mainly on renewables and energy efficiency and without relying on the nuclear. And this report is going to be launched in uh, uh, pretty much uh, a month today. So the key findings of the report um, the study found that, yes, the UK electricity could meet the 50 gram uh, target uh, by focusing uh, mainly on renewables and energy efficiency and in no way compromising system reliability. And I'll explain in a minute that actually our study had um, applied a much more stringent no-wind test than what uh, transmission system operators normally apply. So it was a very, very, very robust uh, system security that catered for the worst possible weather conditions that could affect the output of renewables. Um, in terms of proportion of renewables, and I'll go into that again in, in more details in a minute, but the report found that it was perfectly feasible for renewables to meet over 60% of UK electricity demand by 2030, up from 7% today, and that in fact, under specific conditions, which would require greater interconnection to Europe, but also the right market conditions to allow the UK to export surplus electricity to Europe, the UK could see up to 88% of its electricity demand being met from renewables by 2030. The key thing I should stress here is that those levels of deployment are far more ambitious than what the Committee on Climate Change itself proposed in its Renewable Energy Review a couple of months ago, where it provided an illustrative scenario where renewables would provide 40% of electricity and the rest would be nuclear and CCS. So this actually really challenges a lot of what the, um, the Committee on Climate Change said in its review of renewable energy. Um, but the other big point to note is that all of the deployment, those, those figures you see on the screen, are actually well below the most ambitious projections that either industry or government have put forward on renewable energy. One of the reasons for that is that we, uh, the report also looks at uh, action that you can take on the energy efficiency side uh, and on the interconnection side, which, which allows uh, actually a more, um, uh, which, which allows to minimise the amount of infrastructure that you, you need to build. Um, but the, the key message here is that the, the, the limits on the, le on the levels of deployment of renewables are not technical, nor are they linked to a lack of renewable energy resource. It's all about the economic case for building renewables above, above your national demand needs and whether how deeply integrated you are with the rest of the European system. <coughs> and I'll move on to that in a minute. And the last big finding on the energy efficiency side uh, was that ambitious action on energy demand based on some ambitious energy efficiency scenarios that have been put forward by the, the UK Energy Research Centre shows that we could reduce the cost um, of investment in generation and interconnection by up to £40 billion between now and 2030. So before presenting the three scenarios to you, just a key assumptions. First of all, um, what, in order to have a very robust um, technical report, we imagined uh, a massive anticyclonic conditions lasting several weeks. So that's like a one in a 10 year event, which very obviously very rarely happens, 
uh, and we ensured that should, should there be no wind throughout uh, the British Isles and Northern Europe for a period of several weeks, we could, our model would still be robust uh, from a system security perspective, which is absolutely key uh, when you're trying to put forward the credibility of a high renewable energy pathway. So that was one of the major areas of focus of the report. <coughs> and I should say that the stress test that we applied is about three times stronger than the one that National Grid applies in the UK for the security of the UK system. Um, we looked at two projected levels of electricity demand. Uh, one was a, a central projection, which is based on projections from the Committee on Climate Change, which, sees, uh, which does cater for some level of energy efficiency, but only low-cost measures and measures that are easy to implement, uh, under which we go from 340 hours of electricity consumption today up to 425, and, but that includes some electrification of heat and transport. And then we looked at an ambitious demand scenario that has been prepared by the UK Energy Research Centre. Now that is a very ambitious electricity demand scenario that doesn't just look at electrifying heat and transport, it also looks at behaviour change and certain shifts in the way we use electricity. And, pro and produced, um, it produces an electricity consumption which despite uh, having electrification of heat and electrification of heating, still comes up with a level of consumption that is similar to that of today's. So it's clearly a very ambitious scenario, but it has been uh, demonstrated to be feasible if the right policy instruments are put in place. Now, across those two levels of electricity demand, we then rolled out three generation scenarios. Two core scenarios, which A and B, which I'll go through in a minute, and a renewable stretch scenario that specifically looks at what could happen if the UK had an export market for its surplus renewable electricity to Europe. And all three scenarios meet the 50 gram decarbonisation target set by the Committee on Climate Change. Now, in terms of system security and what happens when the wind doesn't blow, we looked at two options based on technology available today. So we didn't look at, at electricity storage, albeit the report makes it clear that improved R&D and electricity storage should be a really key area of focus uh, for the UK and the EU. But we looked mainly at securing the system either through gas with and without CCS and through greater interconnection with Europe. And the last key assumption to make, again, as a conservative assumption, and to make sure we weren't making any assumption on future electricity prices or how interconnection with Europe could pan out, uh, even when we have a scenario with high interconnection, we do not make any assumptions that the UK becomes a net importer or net exporter. So all the, um, all the scenarios are modelled on the assumption that we import as much as we export. And I'll uh, touch on that again in a minute. So we have three scenarios, two core scenarios and a stretch scenario. Scenario A um, is uh, the scenario where we have a strong deployment of renewables, but we exclusively rely on gas as backup. Now, that is the scenario that we favor the least, uh, but nonetheless does deliver the 50 gram decarbonization target. Under this scenario, uh, renewable uh, electricity accounts from 61% to 62% of electricity demand in the UK, depending on whether we are trying to meet the central demand scenario or the ambitious energy demand scenario. The um, reason for the 61%, 62% figure is not due to uh, the speed of build rates or the size of the renewable energy resource in the UK. It's about the economic case for building more renewables above that limit. So the point being here that at six, uh, according to our consultants, Gareth Hassan, once you get to 61%, 62%, and that all of your, uh, to put it very simply, all of your wind farms are blowing at full pelt, so you are all operating at the same time at full load factors, you get to a situation where renewables will meet all of the electricity demand as well as a free gigawatt of interconnection. And the question becomes, if you start wanting to build renewable electricity above that, you need to have somewhere for that electricity to go when the UK demand is lower. Otherwise, you're just wasting it. Unless, obviously, you have electricity storage solution, but we're not quite there yet. So this, so really the fundamental point here is that the limit here is not about the speed of build rates, it's not about R&D, it's not about the size of the resource, it's about the economic case for building more renewables. It's about having a, the, a market uh, to, to receive the extra renewable electricity. Now in terms of backup here, obviously because we're purely exclusively relying on gas as a backup, you need a lot of gas plants that will be operating at a very low load factor. Uh, so we currently have 76 gigawatts uh, of fossil fuel plants or nuclear plants in the UK. And you would obviously that number would go down in this scenario, but you would end up with 44 to 56 gigawatts of gas plants, some of which would require CCS uh, to secure the system. 
But as I said, the low, they would be operating at very low load factor. So the government would obviously have to incentivize operators to keep old gas plants in the system to only operate them for uh, uh, sort of 50 days a year or something like that. So clearly there's, there's quite a lot of drawbacks with this scenario, which is why we then looked into scenario B. Scenario B takes a very different approach and decides to be far more ambitious on uh, interconnection levels with Europe as a way of securing the electricity system. Uh, and in the, the um, levels of deployment uh, considered here are clearly very ambitious and we perfectly recognize that. We go from three gigawatt of interconnection today to 27 in the ambitious demand scenario or 35 in the central demand scenario. It's worth pointing out here though that those levels of interconnection are very similar to the ones envisaged by the European Climate Foundation's Roadmap 2050 report uh, for the UK. So they fall within what um, the ECF study said was, was feasible for, for UK interconnection. But clearly it's very ambitious. Now, very importantly in this scenario, again to really uh, uh, defend the, the, the credibility and the robustness of our study, we have made no assumption that interconnection creates an export market for UK electricity. So we are still assuming that we import as much as we export. So we're purely looking at inter interconnection as a way of securing the electricity system in the UK. The consequence of that is that we still have the same level of renewable energy demand because we're not assuming there's a market for that excess electricity. So we still have 61% or 62% of demand met by renewables. But very importantly, the level of gas backup plants is much smaller. It goes down by about two and a half times compared to scenario A because you can rely on much more interconnection to secure your system at times of low wind. And again, uh, the, you have a, fewer amount, a smaller amount of gas plant, and that gas plant operates at a higher load factor, therefore is more economic to run and requires less state subsidy to, 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 to keep it up and running to secure the system. So it's a, clearly, uh, it's a better scenario, and it also reduces the risk of locking to gas, because obviously the less capacity you have, the less risk you have of gas generators pressurizing the government to operate more than the strict minimum they should be operating. But the, the key point I should make here is because this is a, a scenario, because, it, because we're modeling uh, a theoretical uh, no net import, no net export scenario, what this doesn't reflect is the fact that in reality, if we had 27 to 35 gigawatts of interconnection with Europe, the UK would either be a net importer of electricity or a net exporter, depending on what was most economic for the UK. So in reality, the, load, the amount of gas being burnt in scenario B might actually be much smaller than what is projected here. But the reason it comes up a bit higher here is that we, have, we did a, a deliberate conservative assumption that we were either a net importer or a net exporter, so that the scenario is robust to various economic assumptions you might want to make. So this is a quick sort of overview of what this looks like. Um, Scenarios uh, A2 and B2 are the scenarios where we take very ambitious action on energy efficiency. And you can see that reduces the amount of uh, uh, low carbon uh, generation by about 40 billion pounds. Uh, and the, I should stress here that the illustrative mix for, uh, that, that the mix of renewables here is just illustrative. The scenario is robust to all sorts of uh, renewable technology mixes. Now we move to scenario C, and scenario C is a renewable stretch scenario because we're making a, 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 a bold assumption. We are saying, what if we have the levels of interconnection contemplated in scenario B, so 27 gigawatt to 35 gigawatt, but what if we change up, but what if we say that this high interconnection creates an export market for UK electricity? Now, if that would clearly require uh, clearer market rules at EU level, but what the report found was that if uh, indeed the high levels of interconnection created an export market for electricity, you, then, you can then see a dramatic increase in the level of renewable electricity, which would be perfectly technically feasible to achieve, up from 61% to up to 88% of meeting electricity demand out to 2030. And again, those levels of deployment are well below the most ambitious uh, industry and government projections. The, not con uh, con the second consequences of making that assumption is that not only do you have much more, far more renewables on the system, you also have far less gas on the system, and the gas no longer requires CCS to meet a carbon intensity target of 50 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. So that's, uh, you're, so you're no longer reliant on CCS, which hasn't yet been obviously demonstrated uh, uh, commercially. 
And the final consequence of that is you also end up in a situation where you have a much lower load factor. So you end up with fewer gas plants operating at a lower load factor because you have far more renewable electricity. You've unlocked the potential to have much more renewable electricity on your system. And this is how uh, it looks. You can see that the gas component is much smaller. You can see that, uh, again, that the, the, the benefit in scenario C2 is that if you combine high connection with high energy efficiency, you substantially reduce the amount of backup generation capacity you need, which is very much in line with what the European Climate Foundation Roadmap 2050 uh, work showed. So I'll just quickly finish, if that's all right, with uh, a few points on the uh, benefits for the UK. Um, um, Clearly, there's several obvious benefits for the UK around sustainable decarbonisation, uh, around the risks of reducing uh, a lock into gas or long-term management of radioactive waste. Uh, but the, 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 the economic benefits for the UK are absolutely massive, and that's the point I think that, that applies not just to the UK, but to several other countries in the EU as well. Um, the UK has a very strong experience of operating in offshore environments with its oil and gas industry, and it also has, um, out of 40 universities worldwide that research marine renewable technologies, the UK has 13 of those universities. So there's an enormous R&D base ready in the UK to exploit the potential of offshore wind. It's all about sending the right, um, the, the right economic signals and investment certainty signals uh, to that industry if we want to really see a strong renewable supply chain in the UK. Um, clearly, there's also uh, various studies showing that the scope for reducing the cost of renewables is absolutely massive. The latest estimate from uh, the trade body for renewables in the UK, Renewable UK, showed that the cost of offshore wind could, under the right conditions, reduce from around £169 per megawatt hour today down to £100 per megawatt hour by 2020. And that's a reduction of uh, above 30%. And that's actually become now the government's number one priority in offshore wind to try and de deliver those cost reductions. Um, just to, and this is just to give you a quick overview of the economic benefits. Uh, you can see that various studies come up with different job projections, contribution to GDPs through uh, marine renewable energy. The one statistics that I, I just want to uh, describe is the, the last one that comes up on the screen from the Carbon Trust. This was looking at jobs that the UK could generate from wave and the tidal stream market. And the point that is fascinating here, and I think really shows that the green jobs argument is not a pipe dream and could actually be a real net benefit to the UK economy, is that the majority of those jobs are not linked to, to building the kit for electricity consumption at home in the UK. It's linked to exports, and not only exports within the EU, exports outside of the EU as well. And this is very evident here where you can see that uh, the more you move to 2030 and beyond, the majority of jobs actually created by having a domestic renewable energy supply chain uh, become uh, uh, more and more linked to exports, which is a, which is a much uh, netter benefit for the, uh, for, for the UK economy. And finally, so in terms of key lessons and, uh, and policy recommendations, I think that the, 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 the number one lesson that we really drew from our report, and it's something that is very valid in the UK context at the moment, which is becoming increasingly anti-renewables, um, is overcoming what I call the catch-22. You have a situation in the UK, but in other European countries as well, where some groups say, well, we don't want to support offshore wind and other forms of renewable energy until the costs go down. But the whole point is that the costs can't go down until you actually give them support in the first place so that those companies feel that they can invest in R&D, that they can um, uh, invest in domestic supply chain, invest in economies of scale and serial production, and create greater competition, and all those things would clearly then reduce the cost. But there's a bit of a vicious circle going on, saying, well, we won't support this until the cost can go down, and the renewables industry saying, well, we need the support to, the, to be able to generate those cost reductions. Um, so I think really clearly, uh, in the context of the UK, we, we are lobbying very hard for the electricity market reform to provide a clear renewables target for 2030, and clear long-term uh, feed-in tariffs, which can really give the investment certainty we need to have to, to have a, 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 UK, uh, a UK renewables industry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thanks. One of the key challenges is also, I guess, thinking European in a UK debate, yeah. so that's probably also yes, an interest. That, that's, that's not the easiest part of the uh, No, job. no, uh, I would say that's another big challenge for the UK. Um, I move over quickly to, to Andre from the Institute for Sustainable Development because Poland has another challenge, of course. Thinking European might, be, uh, not, might not be a problem for Poland, but the coal dependency is, of course, another issue in Poland. So 
Andrei, could you give us a flavor on the discussion on energy scenarios in Poland with respect to this discussion? The floor is yours, Andrei, if the computer allows. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I want to start that uh, we have now developed in Poland the full scenario analysis up to year 2015 that I want to show the some uh, way of thinking, long-term way of thinking presented by the government and the alternative energy policy up to year 2030 that was developed in my institute. Uh, and, I, and I think that it gives you the flavor that Pol uh, Poland probably will be the most difficult country for greening the energy roadmap up to year 2050 on the European level. And give me uh, uh, now possibility to make a small information about the current uh, situation. Uh, the share of the, of the carbon, uh, the intensity of the carbon of the economy that's uh, how was mentioned by Bas is, the, is the probably one of the highest in the Europe, but it's not only the climate problem, it's not only the energy problem, it's the real political problem, because behind of this you have the big uh, power energy and mining lobby, which is generally speaking, you know, uh, mm, this is in the hands of the, of the state. 86% of the electricity in the Poland is this in the state hands. That means we have a quite difficult situation. If we want to be presented more progressive policy, you need to find a way to build the connection with this very con uh, con uh, conservative energy and mining uh, lobby. Uh, if you go another few uh, slides, I, I want to show you uh, that the real cost of the electricity in the Poland is much, much higher than it's you know, calculate it, so probably need to be higher about the 30 percent. That if we want to discuss, we need to edit this external cost. And finally, to talk about the current situations, I think I'll be back and uh, show you the, the last point, that the 40 powers of, of our uh, station are over the 40 years old. This is the, from one side, this is the, the disadvantages. But from the other side, it's a really advantage because we need to change so many infrastructure that we can create and to build a new model. That I think it's necessary to take to account as well. Uh, unfortunately, we are slowly losing the opportunity for these changes. The government not see this is as a real chance for the long-term changes. Uh, the, we are not see the energy efficiency as a driving forces for changing the economy. We not see the renewables as an important part of uh, our uh, energy mix. And I give you the only one examples because I have not too much time. Poland just passed the um, energy efficiency law. It was big discussion between the Ministry of Economy and Ministry of Finance about to edit the one percent of the. Uh, energy efficiency increase each year as an obligation for public administration. And that was pushing by the Ministry of Economy, but was stopped by the Minister of Finance, and Minister of Finance wa was better. That now we have the law which is only up to year 2016 with the white certificates, but with any obligation for public administrations. Uh, if you go to the renewables, another example is that uh, in December year 2010, it was required to prepare the uh, re renewable uh, 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 bill in, in Poland. We have not discussed publicly yet about that. We are losing one and a half year, and probably this law will be developed in year 2013. This is give you the, 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 the feeling about this uh, uh, situation in Poland. If you look now for the official document that was adopted one and a half years ago, uh, the strategy goal looks very nice. On the paper, this is zero energy growth. But if you go to the details, you see that uh, primary energy use increase uh, almost one-fifth, and almost 30% is increase of, of fi finally energy use. 
the government is not going much, much far away that is a require from you related to the renewables to energy efficiency. In year 2020, they want to achieve 50% of the share of the renewables in Poland, but between year 2020 and 2030, only increased by one percentage points. That means that probably will be less energy produced from the renewables because the general will be much more uh, 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 energy how you see from the first, uh, first bullet. Uh, uh, the same is with the uh, 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 energy efficiency. And if you take all this to account in the official documents adopted by the, by the government, you see the situation that between year 2020 and 2030 there will be increase of greenhouse gas emissions. This is generally opposite what is the EU European Union doing. But what about the opportunity? It exists or not? From our analysis, we, we see a lot of opportunities. First of all, it's a high opportunity of energy efficiency. 50% from the technical point of view, we can save of the energy. 25% if you take into account only the economic uh, 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 possibilities. Very important is that the good uh, energy efficiency program can create about 300 new jobs. If we go to the renewables, the technical po potentiality is 46%, but from the economic point of view, to analyze the economic situation, we can achieve in year 2020 almost 22% uh, percent, uh, uh, share in energy mix. The Greenpeace prepared the uh, uh, scenario and they calculated for year 2050 54% of the final energy use from the renewables. It is generally create 200,000 uh, 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 jobs. That how you see the opportunity for the changing the way of thinking the way of building the energy strategy for Poland is quite high. And at the end of the day, it, it means that we decrease the greenhouse gas emission by 50% in the, in the electricity sector, almost 40% in the heat sector. If we go to the alternative energy policy that was developed by my institute, we see that the, on the first, as a most important, need to be the energy efficiency. We need next to change the way of thinking about the model of the energy sector in Poland. From the big power station, which is now, you know, hard call a lignite, but in the future they want to switch for the nuclear one. As a main core of this system, we need to switch for the dispersed energy production to create a lot of small units, to create the local hybrid system based on the renewables, and only to build the some big power station as a reserve, but not more. That means the capacity replacement, especially of the gas, and some people say that maybe there will be the possibility of the clean coal technology, but not only the CCS. But and another issue which is uh, critical in Poland, it is the problem of transmission line. We need to rebuild, we need to modernize, modernize. The key question, are we are going to the, for the nuclear power stations, which is a different type of the, of the uh, transmission line, or we want to build the local system? This is now in the real discussion. Uh, we not see the nuclear power station as a, have a, any economic sense. The costs are too high, they not solve the problem on time, and they can block the development something which is more environmentally friendly and cheaper. Uh, I not put too much to attention, but I agree with the Felix Mate, the transport is the key element for the future. Especially that the guys, your money, is using to build a lot of infrastructure in, in Poland, road infrastructure, and we predict that between year 2005 and 2030, the emission from the transport sector will be more than 50% increase because of EU money. But finalize, I want to conclude. First of all, uh, before I conclude, I want to inform you that now government started to discussion about the uh, low carbon strategy, the outline were prepared and they want to build the whole program. 
the group of the NGO think tanks, including the, the Institute just started to work of produce the roadmap up year 2050. The first result probably will be on a merge. And I want to conclude, we need to build some relation with the big guys. Without the big relation with the big guys, I'm talking of the power sector and mining sector, and to, account, to take to account the public pressure on them will be very difficult to change the way of the thinking, which is now the uh, most, uh, this is now driven the, the energy policy on Poland. Second, uh, the, unfortunately, the climate is any argument in the Poland. It's a so strong reserve about the climate issue that we are talking about the climate, the, the people say they are almost sceptics, all of them. It's not enough to say that we want to modernize the energy sector. I think the main argument, it is to say this is the real chance for modernization of the economy, for create the innovative economy. Poland in innovation, in eco innovation probably is one of the last position in you, in, in, in you, that we really need the third transformation. We, first one was from the communist to no communist system, second one from non-EU to EU, now from the high carbon economy to lo low carbon economy. But the time is very important because now we discuss of building a few big power station, nuclear and base of the coal. If what's happened, it's blocked for decades to changes. Why this discussion about the greening, the ro energy roadmap year 2050, and to make a big discussion with the, with the Polish MP and politician is critical. Thank you. Thank you, Andre, and especially for adding an important topic to the list of challenges, not only efficiency get it done and also infrastructure challenges, but also, and I'm, probably it's stronger in Poland, but it's in all countries, it's the political situation and how to, to get through the, the power of the existing uh, organizations. And very much interesting to hear from you that you really would like to see that we also get them more involved in the situation. Let's see how we can do that. Um, we now move to Spain, so another situation again. So Juan, I give you the floor for a situation how we stand in Spain. Thank you very much. Um, I'll be speaking Spanish. Over there, so. Good morning and thank you very much for the invitation. First of all, as an introduction to Spain's power grid, we have to say that the Iberian uh, Peninsula is uh, a bit of an isolated island when it comes to energy, because there's a bit of a connection with France and uh, a tenuous one with uh, Morocco, but uh, they're not very significant. Now, when I was uh, leading Greenpeace in Spain three years ago, We try to come up with uh, a way to break through in the energy debate in our country. Because in Spain, currently, the debate just rehashes the same ideas. And right now we use 20% for electric energy, and I'm going to refer to that several times. And 20% is... Uh, carbon energy. Renewables make up 30 or 35 percent of electricity production now because there's been a rise in wind power and um, solar power and uh, hydroelectric power make up the rest of the electric energy production. So when it comes to industrial energy use, People, well, they were quite happy with the status quo and people felt that they had a good energy mix, uh, a bit of everything, and that just satisfied everything. We, however, weren't happy with this because we feel that we should go th to a renewables model. And that's why we launched the study that I'm about to uh, show you. We called it 100% renewables. 
we wanted to answer a series of questions. First of all, can the Iberian Peninsula's energy system function based solely or mainly on renewable energy? In order to answer that question, we studied a series of uh, factors. First of all, we looked at the technologies that are already commercially available. So that really was what we based our study on, not on any potential future improvements in uh, technology. Secondly, we excluded 30% of our uh, national territory because it's under either national or European protection, so we excluded that from the scenario. And then we looked at geothermal energy, wave uh, energy, uh, offshore and onshore wind energy, photovoltaic solar energy, um, thermal solar energy, and uh, this really is very important in our study because it has a very high potential for Spain, that's our conclusion. Now the first question we asked of our technicians, those who carried out the study, was is it possible, it, disregarding any issues of cost, is it possible for Spain's electric energy demand to be covered by renewables? And uh, this uh, image here answers that question. Those circles, that uh, uh, large yellow one is the total uh, energy demand, and, uh, and the smaller ones are just electric energy. So actually we could use just solar energy to uh, satisfy all of our uh, demand. So with the solar and wind energy we could easily easily cover all of Spain's energy demand. So these results are, really are excellent. So that's the answer to the first question. Will renewables uh, suffice to satisfy energy demand? Well, yes. And here we can see that solar energy has the uh, biggest uh, potential and followed by wind power and biomass. So that was the first question we had to answer, but of course we had to go further in depth. Because of course the first issue is we have the energy, and then the second question is can we do this? Is it technically feasible for renewables to uh, substitute uh, conventional technologies? And to this end, first of all, we carried out a cost analysis. So we compared the evolution in the kilowatt hours generated by renewables with the uh, evolution in uh, kilowatts uh, generated by nuclear energy and also gas. And what we saw, well, it will come as no surprise to you. Logically, the uh, trend is uh, for uh, the kilowatt of renewable energy to uh, decrease in price. And we see this with wind power. Uh, when the first wind turbines were uh, installed in uh, Spain 15 years ago, they only produced about 15 kilowatts, and uh, that was only 15 years ago, and uh, power has increased exponentially since then, and so the price has also fallen. And uh, we were interested in the year 2050, and we have that here on this graph. Here we compared um, the different uh, types of technology, and we compared the scenarios. We had scenarios 1 to 5, and the one, number 1 would be optimum uh, wind conditions, for example, and 5 uh, was the worst wind uh, conditions. And we did the same for solar energy. So uh, scenario one was the best of possible scenario of solar um, exposition, and so downwards to scenario five. By 2050, the cheapest kilowatt will be wind energy. That's what we found. And we did this for the different types of renewables. And the most expensive scenarios were those when we were uh, generating power with gas and nuclear power. Even if we place uh, the only um, solar cells placed in the worst possible location, 
um, yielded worse costs than conventional technologies. This is very important because in Spain the wrong decisions have been then made because people haven't taken into account this gradual decrease in price, this evolution. People were supporting renewables, but they often uh, did so because there was a lot of public aid, people received uh, uh, subsidy for installing energy, for producing energy. and This, of course, was interesting initially, but the liberal economic sectors attacked uh, renewables because of that, because they were saying that the renewables were too expensive for Spain. This led the government to uh, cut down the subsidies because they felt that this was excessive public spending. And now, of course, we're writing 2011, and the increase in the cost of the barrel of oil has actually meant that there's been uh, more of a boost in uh, support for renewables than the boost experienced in 2010 with all the public aid. So we can't just look at a snapshot of each moment in time. We always have to take into account trends and the developments for the future. So we feel that the only thing that can wean us off oil is renewables. And of course, oil is also what's damaging our balance of payments the most. So we feel that uh, a wrong decision was made, really just uh, based on a snapshot when uh, these uh, subsidies were pulled. Having analyzed the technological potential and the costs, the technicians started to uh, work on uh, looking at different energy mixes. All of them, of course, one with 100% renewables. The, one of the criteria used for the mix was uh, technological diversity. It's possible not to depend uh, too much on one type of energy. You see the one in orange here is thermoelectric sol solar power, the blue one is uh, wind power. So you see here uh, there's a mix of energies but they're all renewables. Another factor we always took into account was the issue of land use. Because that's very important. Uh, that's one of the most uh, that's one of the weakest points when it comes to renewables. But at the same time, we saw in our scenarios that there was no great impact on land use. Here you see a map of our country with the technologies distributed throughout uh, different types of technology for different areas. This is a different mix here. Here the main criteria was uh, cost. When it comes to just looking at cost efficiency, wind power would uh, be more dominant because it produces the cheapest kilowatts. Another analysis is also that you could add to the 100% uh, that mix of 100% renewables also trying to manage demand. If you manage demand adequately, then of course that also reduces cost. Here, we, see we need to integrate the different sectors. You can see here we've included, for example, transport, and once again, thermosolar energy is actually the most relevant one, seems to be the most beneficial for our country. And here are our conclusions, or are some highlights from our conclusions, which can be used to shape future policies in Spain. First of all, Geographical distribution is very important. What does this mean? Well, that uh, renewable power plants shouldn't all be concentrated in one area. They should be distributed throughout the country. Because, uh, just like you said, in, in the UK, for um, you need uh, distribution throughout the territory. You were talking about wind power. 
and um, it's also important in order to maintain generation and uh, security and safety of the system. For example, if you don't have any wind, well, what do you do? Well, the first strategy to counteract these sorts of things is having a more poten um, potential install. So you have to install more power for, um, than what you actually need under ideal conditions to meet demand at all times. And of course, then we have the types of renewables that don't depend on weather, such as biomass or geothermal power, hydraulic power, and pumped potential, for example, pumped storage. It's important to also perhaps throw those into the mix just to boost system resilience. And then, of course, we have the Thermo, the combined thermal and solar plants that can use either solar power or biomass uh, when uh, the weather doesn't allow you to use solar power. And that, we feel, adequately responds to the question of, and what if there is no wind? What do we do? We see that there are many different uh, possible combinations that will enable us to uh, use 100% renewables. And here, as with anything, we also see that diversity is really key. With greater diversity, the system is uh, more secure, more stable, more resilient, and you need to install less power generating potential. What we see is that uh, solar power is uh, the most efficient one because you can use it um, when uh, the demand for energy is the greatest, for example, in summer when people use air conditioning. So for us, renewables really is um, a great uh, opportunity, particularly thermal solar power. In Spain, if we want 100% renewables, we must, we must develop thermoelectric solar power, not just um, photovoltaic solar energy. As we've s we also saw that we don't have a lot of biomass available, so there's not a lot of potential for using biomass, but it's a good backup solution um, for the thermoelectric uh, solar plants. Well, I've already mentioned this, but I'll say it again. Variety is key. We need technological variety. As we've said from the beginning as well, in order to uh, achieve this uh, mix and only relying on renewables, we need political will. We need this to be our goal for 2015. We need to uh, take decisions accordingly because the decisions we make now are going to shape our future energy mix. And of course, we also need to improve our power grid, our power transmission lines, our connections. And that would boost efficiency. But even with the current power grid in Spain, we could um, reach our target of only using renewables. In this, of course, in these scenarios, we also see that we produce a surplus of energy. Even today, Spain is... Uh, exporting energy. And now to conclude, I just want to say it is possible to uh, only use renewables both for electricity and total energy demand if we uh, secure variety and if we install enough generation power to cover demand. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Juan, for the this Thank you very much, Juan. On where we stand. Well, we are ab about at a time where we should be finishing, but we started a bit late, so, so apologies for the delay also at the end. But still, of course, we need to do Germany and France. But we will do them quickly because we know those countries the best, I guess. <laughs> uh, certainly, the debate in Germany, of course, is, is quite interesting to see compared to debates in other countries. You could say it is, it's an outlier, but maybe we should more say that Germany hopefully is more the, the example of the other debate in other countries. So, Germany.
Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think there are two options. If we are running out of time, I could switch into the German and speak much faster. That would make it harder uh, for the translator and the most of you. And so I will, and so uh, I'll, s I'll stay with, uh, with with English, and I will skip a lot of slides. And uh, you can download these. Uh, uh, and in the end, I give you the commercial where you can read the, all the 600 pages, which I dis will describe in uh, five or seven minutes. Uh, what I would like to report on is the Blueprint Germany project. That is a project which was pretty influential uh, in the German debate. Um, it was commissioned in 2009, and we worked with 10 researchers for one and a half year on this because the WWF asked us to describe in, in a very detail how the transition uh, of the economy towards a low carbon economy could look like in Germany. Uh, uh, so, the, so the target was uh, to make the exercise how a 95% greenhouse gas emission reduction could look like in Germany. It was pretty influential and the debates of the double U-turn uh, we had in Germany, uh, because you have to be aware of that we had the first U-turn in 2010, when the government decided on the lifetime extension on the nuclear power stations, but they complemented this with a very ambitious long-term strategy for decarbonization. And after the second U-turn in March uh, 2011, they removed uh, the lifetime extension and they accelerated it a bit uh, to the situation we had uh, since 2002, uh, but they did not remove the long-term ambitious uh, program. And for the discussion of this long-term decarbonization program, uh, the, blue, the Blueprint Germany project was, was pretty influential and you can find many, many numbers by the comma in the, in, the, in the government papers from this study. That was not uh, intended, it was coincidentally, but it helped. Uh, the, the key questions, I will not repeat this here, is to make the transformation as a highly mm -hmm. industrialized country, that means as a country which maintains the ability to produce steel and cement, etc., etc. And the key question is, what is a robust strategy? Uh, this is the scenario concept. I would like, I, I, want, I do not want to describe this in details, but we worked on three scenarios. The first is the reference. We projected all the existing policies. The second is we should look into all the innovations which are in the pipelines, and we should look, we should have a look on the capital stocks. But there are two. There were two no goes. The first no go was no CCS, and the second no-go was no imports of sustainable biomass. And we reached uh, a level which was about 85, 80, 86% emission reduction. Then we said, okay, if we would like to go for this, we have to break the no-goes. So we, 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 we analyzed what would happen if we would like to allow CCS for process emissions, that means for the steel industry, uh, and the cement industry and, and to create negative si uh, carbon sinks by bringing CO2 from biofuel production underground. And uh, secondly, we allowed the um, import of sustainable biomass at a level uh, which is based on an equal rights concept. That's, that means we took the global potential or an assumption on the global potential of sustainable biomass, divided these by the population of the world population of 2050 and multiplied this by the German population projections uh, by 2050. And that's the equal rights, uh, equal rights uh, phil uh, philosophy. Uh, I will skip this. Uh, I think there, 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 are, there are three major issues. Uh, you have to think about car carbon-free energies for all sectors, which might be renewables but which might be in transport or in buildings or even electricity if it is produced uh, from renewables. Uh, the second is uh, efficiency. There are three main drivers of energy efficiency. That's especially in Germany as a North European cold country. It's about buildings. Uh, it's about the transport sector. 
and it's about electric appliances. I don't want to go into details. The more interesting point is the is the is the is the, is the, is the, is the projection for the power sector, uh, and there are three messages from 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 this graph here, uh, and you could focus only the the most right bar. The first message is there is a lot of potential uh, for energy efficiency, uh, and f uh, honestly, we have to admit that we are a rapidly aging country. We will lose 10 million population in Germany, even if we have even if, if, if we have a very high surplus from migration. And so uh, 10 percentage points come, come, come from this trend. But I think there's a, there's a lot of potential of energy efficiency, as I, I described this before. Secondly, uh, in the North European conditions, it will be a heavy wind system, which is heavily based on wind. And you can see here that especially offshore wind will play a major role. The third message is that there is a limited role of biomass and there is a significant role of the storage uh, installations. The, the limited role of biomass is a result of the limited potential of sustainable biomass because there are some sectors where biomass is without any alternative. That's the aviation, that's the long distance heavy duty vehicles uh, and if you have a look on this then the sustainable biomass potential, as I described this before, is nearly exhausted. And so there's limited space for biomass and the power generation. And there is beyond 2020, 2030, is a major role of, 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 uh, uh, of storage uh, in a heavily wind-based system. You can, to some extent, uh, substitute this by more interconnections, uh, but we have also the problem of low and high wind years and interconnection helps uh, more, more uh, on a much shorter uh, 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 time scale. Uh, if you do this with CCS, the, the, the structure is the same. The only is the CCS substitutes some of the storage needs. There are three pillars. We apply the decomposition methodology and you, you can see here the contributions in terms of greenhouse gas reduction from different strategies. And the only message I would like to give with this is there are three thirds, approximately three thirds. One is energy efficiency, where buildings, electric appliances, and transport plays a role. Second third is about renewables. And the third third is about other uh, measures because it is also about agriculture, it is also about process emissions in industry, etc., etc. The key issue, and that I highlighted before, and uh, I would like to give you the specific number, that 60% of the emission reduction potential we modeled here is heavily linked or strongly linked to long living capital stocks. That means Action in time is the key. It is not only about options. It is about uh, implementing options at the right point in time. Otherwise, it, is, it will be get very difficult. The key message here is it will cost a lot of investments. And we have to invest a lot. But on the other hand, it will save the bill we pay for Russians and other nice regions of the world. Uh, and the problem is that, that that's fine, but it is also a wealth transfer. And avoided wealth transfer is internal value added. And Germany is a romantic country, but it is also a business country. And protecting value added within the country has been a long tradition in this country and is, or is also, this is also an important point of this strategy. And from this graph, you can see that we have to invest for the next 20 years a lot of money. But that is the insurance premium that we are no more longer vulnerable beyond 2035. And that's the, that's the, key, that's the key message. Uh, there are, and that's, this is my second last slide, there, are, there is a need for some uh, new approaches. We need the long-term perspective. Uh, 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 in policy making. Uh, we have to reflect the windows of opportunity and the issue of existing or non-existing alternatives. It's only a reminder, bear this in mind if it comes to biofuels. Uh, phase, the simple phase out of biofuels is not an option on the long term because there are sectors where we have to deal with this. 
We have five challenging debates. The first is we have to have the discussion on biomass, of the role, of the limits, but also on the opportunities of biomass. We have in Northern Europe the problem of the future of heat networks in a high efficient and no carbon economy. The third is we have to discuss on CCS. It is not about coal-fired power plants. It's about the steel industry and the cement industry and of creating net sinks. The fourth is infrastructure. I, want, I would not like to, to go into the details, but this is one of the key issues. And uh, in this vertical system, we have to think about market design. Energy-only markets are not compatible with a vertical system which is mainly based on renewable energies. And so we can't integrate uh, renewable energies at a large scale in the existing energy-only markets. We have to change the market design by many reasons uh, and even for the, inter for, for the intermediate period. The last point, and I think uh, I, I, I didn't want to, to, to skip this, uh, this is the set of policy targets the German government has said that is not our target, uh, but I think that's the framework for future policy making to go for uh, 80 to 95 percent greenhouse gas emission reductions, but to go for very, very significant uh, uh, shares in renewables and to go for very aggressive targets in energy, in, in energy efficiency. Uh, and that is after the, the W turn, the framework of, uh, of policy making. And that will not disappear. That is the line of Merkel and Westerwelle. And there is probably no more right government during the next 20 years. And so no government during the next 20 to 30 years will be able to cross these lines. And so this will be a major driver. Uh, and in the night of the decision of the second U-turn, the Swiss ambassador uh, said in remarkable, made in remarkable, an interesting remark on the situation. He said, those who have problems, those have problems. But those who have the problems first have the better chances. Thank you, Felix, for this wise concluding remark on Germany, and I see that you not only work on scenarios for climate and energy, but also political scenarios, and your, your scenario that for the next 20 years there will be no right government in Germany. Let's see no on... More right. No more right. No more right. Okay, let's, let's see to what extent that scenario will come. Yeah, yeah, I know, no, the, the right wing, not the right, correct one. Okay, so now very briefly we move to France, uh, since we had Thierry Solomon on the agenda, but unfortunately he just, well, two days before this session he, he notified that he couldn't come. So therefore we are very happy that Mike Fink from Cannes France, Climate Action Network France, could step in and at least give us a very brief overview on, on what's going on in France on the issue. So very much for stepping in here at this very late stage. Okay, thank you much. So I, um, yeah, I will give a short overview on the French scenario landscape. I won't pr present a one, one single scenario. So, um, as, ah, sorry, I, yeah, sorry. As it was also already presented before, there are more and more scenarios in Europe and in the different member countries. I now know that there are a lot of them missing who are presented already because this is dating from 2009. So that really shows, shows that there is a, really a movement going on. Uh, but they are not equally distributed among all the member states. When we look at uh, France, uh, we have in the moment mainly governmental scenarios or scenarios that are developed by, by institutes that are close to the governmental orientation. So there's no real discussion on the energy mix, which could be triggered by uh, the existence of different scenarios and different technology choices. And the only, let's say, serious techno technically ambitious alternative to ne scenario is this uh, Negawatt scenario. So I'm, yeah, it's a little bit sad that uh, they could not be here to present their new scenario, which uh, will come out officially next week. So if you speak French, 
come to Paris next week and listen to this presentation. I think it will be really interesting. And um, yeah, what I want to underline here is that um, yeah, in France, scenarios are not really seen as tools for public debate, and this is really um, something that should be changed, and which is changing also in the moment, because after Fukushima, the government finally announced that there will be a nuclear phase-out scenario, the first one in France in January 2012, coming out. So, so this is, um, yeah, if you see this image, you know that Negawatt is not far away. I, th I only show it to you, it's really, as, uh, yeah, the simple principle of, of Negawatt. You, you reduce energy by sufficiency and efficiency, and then you can cover the rest of the energy needs by renewable energies. And I only show it to you because I think it's really important to have uh, uh, easy introduction to the somehow, uh, yeah, to the scenarios that are getting more and more technical and more and more detailed. And to have a public debate on a scenario, I think you need something like this to, to introduce it to, to a public debate. Yeah. And then the second point in France, which is interesting for you, I guess, is that there is since 2011, all French regions have to develop energy scenarios for their territorial unity. Um, but again, a discussion on the energy mix is excluded. Only renewable energies are considered, which are produced on the territory. So uh, there are in parallel citizen initiatives that are emerging, and which are developing alternative scenarios. And yeah, this is also an yeah, interesting debate in the, in the moment, I won't go into detail here, but they all call it virage energy, that, that means in English energy turnabout. And then uh, the last thing I which I wanted to present is uh, a project, the Climate Action Network is working on the moment, it's a European project, which is called NC Low Carb, Engaging Civil Society in Low Carbon Scenarios. It's a cooperation project between CSO and research institutes, and we use uh, macroeconomic models. That means we are not only thinking about the technology choices, but also the model uh, is able to calculate macroeconomic impacts of technology choices. And so the objective of the project is a joint construction of ambitious energy scenarios for Germany and France. And the process includes the contribution of various national stakeholders. Uh, that means we are organizing uh, stakeholder workshops where we try to integrate their vision and technology choices in, in the scenarios and then we will produce uh, contrasting scenarios uh, which we will again discuss with them. And the aim of, of this process is to, to achieve scenarios that are not social acceptable, I won't say this, but have a higher <laughs> stakeholder acceptance than, than scenarios that are only developed by one uh, NGO, for instance, or, yeah. So, this is only, the first part of the project was a comparison of existing French scenari scenarios, and there you see in red, uh, the share of nuclear energy in the electricity mix in 2050. And yeah, you see that there's not so much diversity for the moment, so. We really need this discussion in France. And my last slide is, yeah, what we want to do in our project is to look on, yeah, how we can come from what is technically possible to, uh, yeah, perhaps uh, to what is, is more likely to become reality. So our main object is, like, uh, is, like I said before, not to, to develop a normative future vision, but to describe those path pathways which are to supported by main stakeholders in Germany and France. So, and yeah, for sure, one of the main cleavages in France will be the nuclear phase out without this, within this discussion. And our, yeah, our results will be ready in January 2012. Thank you very much, Mike, for giving this very short but concise and very clear presentation on the discussion in France. And, well, we know that on the nuclear side in France, uh, well, the, the debate can be improved, let's put it that way. Now I give the floor to Claude, because now on the agenda was debate. But, of course, you understand, given the delays we had, we will skip that one. Apology for that. But, of course, there will be time afterwards as well to discuss. So now I just immediately go to... Claude, who well now can wrap up all the things that he's heard, and he can do that as concise as always. 
Um, I think what, what I want to do is just to, to give you the political context. <coughs> European Commission, DG Energy, will come out with its, its roadmap uh, end of November and maybe even beginning of December. That means that during the Danish presidency there will be a, a much more detailed discussion between the European level but also between the national level on uh, what is uh, the, the vision for the future energy system. And uh, what we intended to do today is to show to you, uh, but also to the European Commission, that for example, uh, assuming that France will forever be a 102% nuclear country in its power mix is wrong. Because uh, if, and I think there's a lot of likelihood that there will be a government or president change in France, then the scenario for France will, be, will look completely different. Uh, and of course, uh, for UK, for Poland, for Spain, for Italy, uh, there is uh, really different scenarios. And in that respect, uh, what we have done today is the beginning of linking with you, linking with the national, uh, let's say, pro uh, green energies uh, stakeholders to, to, to work together and to make policy makers at national level and at EU level aware. We have credible scenarios uh, to, to go uh, and to have a clear vision on where we need to go to 2050. It's about energy efficiency, it is about renewables, it is about uh, infrastructure, it is about market design, and then of course it's also about uh, agriculture and some, some other uh, sectors and, and all this in a, in a, in a climate uh, framework. Uh, and even more politically, even more important, 2030 is tomorrow when it comes to investments. And I think there is a relatively clear view on what has to be done for 2030. And the good news also when you aggregate roughly all the scenarios presented is that in 2030, uh, we can have, let's say, we can have organized a transition from a system which is in the power system today, 30% uh, coal, 20, 22% nuclear, uh, to a system where in 2030 we will have 60% plus renewables and uh, a very high uh, likelihood that the rest will be heavily gas dominated. Which means that for the power sector, uh, the problems of climate change emissions, the problem of geopolitical dependence, the problems of cost control will be solved between now and 2030 depending on the political decisions of the next two or three or four years. Uh, and that is really the challenge. And you can imagine that not only the nuclear lobby, not only the coal lobby uh, is uh, very, very scared about our very robust scenarios, but we have a new enemy of our scenarios, which is the gas industry. It's very, very clear that the gas industry, or at least some of the big gas companies organized in e-gas, like Shell and ExxonMobil, uh, they have understood that if you do efficiency and if you combine it with renewables, gas will not go up like that. Gas will peak and then it will, will go down slowly because there will be much less gas in the building sector and in the power sector, gas will be a bridge together with the renewable sector. And so we have a very, very hard time because parts of the gas sector are now very, very vocal through their spokesperson like Dieter Helm, who says, get rid of renewable targets in 2020 and get rid and never go to renewable targets and efficiency targets for 2030. And that is the battle which is on, and uh, I'm very uh, confident that if we are well organized, uh, we will be able to win this battle also because we have a credible story for more jobs in Europe, 
for much less geopolitical dependence, do we really want to be dependent on the political situation in the Caucasus, in Iraq, in Iran, in Russia? Is that our choice? Or do we want to have a policy put in place where we are largely in control of what is happening on energy? And our scenarios are, when it comes to costs, especially in the power sector, are below the scenarios of the gas, coal, and nuclear. Uh, below, because of the merit order effect that renewables bring into the system. Uh, so we are robust, and therefore the battle will be fiercer than it was before, because all those of these sectors which I have named, and some of these big companies, are more scared than ever of the scenarios which uh, craftsmen, small and medium enterprises, uh, ESCO companies, renewable companies, and citizens and cities in Europe want to have done. So the battle uh, is, is uh, on, the jury is out, uh, and, uh, but I think this is a starting of this, and so we will link together. Thank you very much for being present uh, this morning, and uh, uh, let's join forces to make this happen. Thank you.